Hey, Lord Henry, welcome. That is correct. Um, it it really shouldn't have come as much as a surprise. I mean, Sven has said, well, he has hinted quite a bit before that there weren't going to be any any DLCs. Um, so it was this was just confirmation in the interview, I guess. People were still holding out hope about it. We have known, I mean, honestly, we've really known for a while that there wasn't going to be another, that there wasn't going to be a Baldur's Gate 4 and that there wasn't going to be, or weren't going to be any DLC um, for this. And I think it, it is disappointing, but I think that there's enough, more than enough content here that they've put work into to to keep everybody fascinated with it and I'm I'm actually a little happy to see that that I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it that Larian is has decided that they're going to go out on a high note and they're not gonna try and push the next version of this to try and just capitalize on it. You know count you know, like the other big franchise games. Um, they're not just going to throw out another thing quickly that's subpar or something like that just to capitalize on the name. I'm happy to see that they're going to go their own way with things again. Um, and I understand that from a business perspective. Because I'm sure the licensing from Wizards of the Coast was horrifically expensive. Um for this so and, and I completely get that so but I mean Sven does have he said he's got a roadmap for what he wants you know things to be my my guess is that we're going to see a new divinity original sin while they are working on the next homegrown RPG. That's my guess. But, but yeah, that was officially straight out and out said during the interview um, that we won't be getting any of that stuff, so... Hey, Philip, welcome. And I think that they gave us, I think they gave us a playable experience at launch. Um, I think what really made, 
but there were issues, obviously, with the game and with the content. I think what made Larian so special through all of this was two things. One, the early access period. That was amazing for anybody who played it and allowed them to get a huge amount of feedback on the playability of the game to allow them to adjust how things were at launch. If you're not doing an early access period like that on your RPG, you're doing it wrong. That's just that's just the end of this the end of the story now. The second thing is that that made Larian special was the attention to the fan comments about their content and adjusting it accordingly. Um, having only one way to recruit Minthara, and that, and that way being the destruction of the Druid Grove, it cut out options. So then allowing her to be knocked out or disabled in some way to be able to see her return in new content later on to be able to recruit her satisfied more of the player base and it's honestly them taking input like that and creating new content to adjust player expectations and and wants and, and hopes is another thing that made Larian hugely different from other studios. So, I think that's what made it special. I mean, we can't forget that, you know, on launch, Act 3 was and nearly unplayable. <laughs> um, especially on console, the frame rates were just horrible. Um, so there were, and there were things done um, you know, n optimizations to help correct that. And I think that's how, that's been the state of the industry for a decade and a half now, is that people throw out content and then they utilize day one patches, hot fixes, and patches to refine the performance, to optimize the game. There wasn't a lot of that that was needed, but it was certainly needed in this game, and Larian did it. Um, so they followed the same script as most other large developers do um, in that regard. And if they would have put out a completely polished, optimized game at the start, it would have allowed them more time to focus on the on the content and glitches and bugs and that sort of stuff afterward. But, you know, that is what it is. That's just how the gaming industry works nowadays. Hey, Eric, welcome. But, yeah, it's... It's one of those things where... So many other things were done right after or before and after launch that made Larian so different from the rest of the gaming industry that they set a new standard for it and it really and I mean really um, has a negative impact on those companies who follow Baldur's Gate 3 with their own RPG if you are doing things differently and I get for small studios, that can be unfair. Um, let's not forget that Larian was not a AAA studio. They certainly are now. <laughs> but they were not a AAA studio, but they weren't a small developer either. But that is not a fair criticism when you have AAA studios who can't put out the same type of content or the same type of attention to detail or the same type of responsiveness to their fan base as what Larian did. I don't want to hear any complaints from Capcom um, about things that Larian did that they should be doing with their game. I don't, I don't want to hear any of those those comments. If, if anybody from Capcom comes out and says, 
it's unfair to compare our development to Baldur's Gate 3. I'm going to laugh at them. Um, if you have the money and the, re and the time and the resources, then you should be doing all of these same things. So, like I say, I'm not... I, I can't say that same thing for small studios, smaller and in indie studios, but for large companies, I don't want to hear any of your any of your belly aching about it. Hey, Red. Welcome to the stream. Um, how would I rate Baldur's Gate 3? And I'm assuming Baldur's Gate 3. Um, not 1, 2, or the rest of the series. Um, how would I rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? That's... It's, it's a bit of a loaded question. Um, because if you haven't seen it or watched my streams before, I come from a tabletop D&D background. So anything that's based around uh, tabletop d and I'm going to love. So that's going to put me at a 10 out of 10 every time. As far as the overall game goes, I'm going to rate this 9 to 9.5 out of 10. Content, performance, adaptability of the of the developer to their fan base, um, all are top notch. So. so let's go ahead and get started here. Welcome everyone to today's live stream. Episode number 36 of our Baldur's Gate 3 Bard Gameplay Series. I'm Commander Jarval, and I want to thank you all for coming along on our journey today. So, on an admin note, I'm, I'm getting better, but the cough is still here. So again, I'll be muting my mic whenever I have to cough. If I don't come back immediately, or there are long periods of silence, then I forgot to unmute my mic. And please drop a comment and let me know that I'm silent so I can I can bring it back. I try not to, but uh, but please give me a reminder if if I don't come back or I forget to unmute it, and I'll uh, I'll get back to you as quick as I can. So, um, not much else on the admin note. Uh, admin notes for the game except for one other thing some of you we commented in the just chatting about it I was going to talk about this briefly today anyway but I'll hash it now for anybody who's just joining there there was an interview with Sven the head of Larian Studios where he he came out and made it very explicitly clear two things one that there is not going to be any DLC for Baldur's Gate 3 and two, that there is not going to be a Baldur's Gate 4 um, from Larian. These are things that had been kind of hinted at and um, inferred from conversations that Sven has had in, in interviews that he's had in the past. But this was by far the clearest of, of him coming out and saying, we're just not going to do it. Um, I know that's disappointing for a lot of people. However, the amount of content that's in this game and the responsiveness that Larian has had to the fan base about adding changes to that content and new content, I think, has been enough to keep us all thoroughly engaged in the game for a very long time. And expecting DLC, again, in today's world, everyone expects DLC out of every game that they play. Um, but I respect the decision to say, this is our content, it's the best content that we can come up with. We're going to now move on, rather than trying to soak every single dollar we can out of this, and maybe not put out some of the greatest stuff. We've all seen DLCs that come out that never should have been put out, or that should have been put out as part of the base game. And they're just doing it to squeeze every dollar they can out of a franchise and I respect the fact that Larian is not going to do that um, they realize that they've put out a stellar game that it has done its job it has given us the content that we wanted and they're willing to move on to the next thing and Sven has a roadmap for that 
And the the long term roadmap is to make the um, RPG to end them all. Basically, is his comment. Um, and that's what Larian's going to continue doing. I don't think their next game is going to be that one. I expect that we're probably going to see another Divinity Original Sin game probably in the next three years. That's already established uh, content mechanics for them, so it's fairly easy for them to put something out like that. While at the same time still working toward that other RPG. Um, that is going to be their next crown jewel um, in, in their studio's um, repertoire. So, again, just to reiterate, there won't be any DLC for Baldur's Gate 3 and there won't be a Baldur's Gate 4 by Larian. Um, both things completely understandable. And for me, that does not take anything away from either the game or from Larian Studios. I am... Um, I'm happy to see them moving on to something and eagerly await their next installment of whatever they're going to do. So on to our recap. At the end of last week's episode, we had finished all of the side content, so to speak, in, um, in the Gauntlet of Shar. We had talked to and had the encounter with your gear. We had dealt with Lirthendor. We had dealt with Balthazar. And now there's nothing left for us to do except to execute the trials. Now, you can actually do this without executing the trials. <laughs> if you want to go find out how, there's a video on it <laughs> that... Uh, shows you how to how to skip all of these things um, but we're going to go do them then we are going to make a quick check through act one and make sure that there is nothing else that we want to get out of act one and then we are going to go into the shadow fell and have our encounter with the night song so let's go ahead and jump right in here Yeah, Lord Henry, I, I agree. And it was accepted way too long by the gaming community. Um, and I think now we've all realized that, uh, especially in the day and age of Steam, that we can just speak with our wallets. And there's now an expectation that they respond to Don't it. So. So let's go back out here and we will head toward the trials. What happened to the Thaniel quest? You can see here that we have reunited Oliver and Thaniel. Um, we went through the encounter, not last stream I don't think, but the stream before that, where we um, talk to Thaniel, um, in his shadow area, um, and, and it reunited them both, um, during, I can't remember which, if it was this playthrough or the other playthrough, um, he glitched out and he did not end his combat. Um, and we ended up having to kill him to end the combat. I went back immediately, as I said, I went back immediately off stream and replayed it. And he, the combat ended normally as it should have. Don't know what caused the glitch. Um, I haven't been able to replicate it again. Um, but it most certainly was a, a glitch. So I didn't feel bad about reloading that and, and replaying it. So here is one of the trials here, where last playthrough we did all of these with Shadowheart, just from a, an RP perspective. We're not necessarily going to do that this time. 
and as part of that, I want to see some curves as the disintegrating Nightwalkers. Never a dull moment. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is go up to the altar here. The bowl contains an ancient rust-colored blood stain. It forms a neat disc, as if spilled calmly and willingly. This is one of Lady Shah's trials. Allow me, please. Oh boy, I guess from a role-playing perspective, I'm probably going to do it again. Of Lady okay, now for this, this is an Indiana Jones reference uh, from the Last Crusade, the Leap of Faith. Um, what you have to do is make your way over to this far platform. The problem is where, how do you do that? And you can see kind of the pathway here, but the closer you get, the more that pathway Have to keep pushing. starts to go away. So, the way to really do it is marked here on the floor. You can see the pathway. Alright, what now? Best be on my way. Still breathing, despite everything. Marked out here on the floor. And you can follow that pathway no time to waste. Um best by going into overhead view. So here you can see the path starts just to the left of the statue. So you don't want to be right in the middle. You want to be offset to the left a little bit. And then you can make your way out. Now where does it end? It doesn't give you a strict ending point here. But it's about three quarters of the way out to the next one. So I'm going to come out. I do want to look at something because that no, that doesn't. So I'm going to come out to about here, and then I'm going to jump. Okay, and I can jump to this platform here. So now this one, the path comes out immediately. Um, right in front of the statue, but you can jump across this point. So I'm going to come over to the left side of the pillar. I'm just going to jump straight across. And now how far out does it go? Well, you can do this a couple of different ways. So I'm going to go out to just before the statue and jump to the center pillar. And then from here, you can come out straight off the pillar, jump, go up a ways toward the next pillar. I'll take this way. So again, jump straight out, and then you can move a ways up toward the pillar. Now here's where a couple of things come into play. So if you have a high enough strength skill, or the enhanced leap ability, or some other way to enhance your jump, you can jump quite a ways over there. This thing is about two thirds of the way up. So I can probably move up a little more. And then I can see how far my jump will get me, and it will get me all the way there. Okay. So it's really not that hard to do. Um, if you try and follow the path the entire way, things are going to get to be a, a real pain. And I learned that quickly 
Um, I tried to illustrate taking the full path on my on the Paladin playthrough, and you can see how hard um, it was compared to the way that I did it there. Okay, so we picked up our second Umbral Gem there. And now we're going to continue on with the trials. Her most hallowed mercy. Okay, now this is the self-same trial. So, how the self-same trial works is it's going to create a duplicate of you and or your party that you're going to have to fight. So, the, the way to make this much easier is to simply go out here, ungroup your party. Need to keep going. And only have one person in the room. Now, when you're in here, I actually haven't done this. of an ancient blood offering. Another of Lady Shah's trials that her initiates must face, this one would challenge their combat prowess. Okay, and enemy much of the time. at the time you interact with the altar, until we shed that, which holds us back. that is when the avatar spawns. Okay, so I'll be anxious to see what the avatar is like when we get in there. Okay, now the avatar always spawns in the same spot. Okay, so I failed my perception check, but I don't need it. Okay, the avatar always spawns up here. And you can kind of see where the avatar is based on where you can and can't walk here. And I'm just making sure. So there's the avatar, and you can see that the avatar is completely without gear. So 
one, by just bringing one character in here, and two, by removing all of your items when you interact with the altar, and then putting those items back on afterward, you're going to gain a combat advantage. Um, because this Shadow Heart is unprepared for this encounter here, basically. Easy enough. So, with our gear, remember, if she misses, then the helm is going to kick in or smite the Graceless. They're gonna t she's going to take radiant damage. Anytime she takes radiant damage, she's going to take um, more stacks of reverberation. Those stacks of reverberation are going to stack up very quickly. She's going to take more damage from that. And then she tried to move while she was inside of Spirit Guardians. And it ended the fight. So, easy enough to do. And we can grab our second Umbral Gem. And now we get to the one that she is completely and totally unsuited to do. <laughs> um, but we'll do it with her anyway, just because I'm such a sucker for role playing. Can't slow down. So for this. What I am going to do is swap her boots, because we're not going to need any combat in here. Oh, yep, I did. Thanks, Lord Henry. I appreciate it. In the self-same trial, it's important to hold Alt while you're going through here. And you can search these skeletons and that sort of stuff while you're in here. You can find a few little things here and there, but what's important is up here, and it's very important. It is a signature for certain builds in the game, and that's Killer's Sweetheart. It's easy to miss, and I missed it last time, um, and had to come back and get it. Um, and Lord Henry reminded me then as well, um, because it's just laying on the ground here. So it's, it's, it's something that pops out of the avatar after you're done. Probably easily missed by everyone, <laughs> and I wish they would just pop it into your inventory. Um, but we'll look at it once we get out here. Hey, Ostomer, welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay, so Killer Sweetheart. This has the Executioner trait. When you kill a creature, your next attack roll will be a critical hit. Once spent, this effect refreshes after a long rest. Now, you can see the... Actually, why are my reactions not... Okay, so it is asked. So, um, the, the Executioner trait is set to be a, an ask 
um, an ask you type of type of thing once you've got it available to you. And you'll what I'm you know I, I'm not explaining that well. What I mean is that when you kill a creature, it's going to pop up another you have this thing available do you want to use it type of interaction so it's going to ask you like luck of the far realm does do you want this attack to be a critical and you don't have to use it you can store it up and that works extraordinarily well in conjunction with various other rings that you may have, which I've already got saved up. Okay, oh no, it's not the ring, it's the amulet. With the Surgeon Subjugation Amulet which is once per long rest when scoring a critical hit on a humanoid, you can paralyze them for two turns. What this means is that if you have Killer's Sweetheart, you can kill an enemy, and then whenever you want, you can make your next attack be a crit. And then when that crit happens, you can use the Surgeon Subjugation Amulet to paralyze that target. So it's a guaranteed paralyze of a target for two, turn, for two turns. You can use Luck of the Far Realms to do the exact same thing. This allows you to do it um, for this specific purpose and still use Luck of the Far Realms to guarantee a crit for high damage on something else or vice versa. So this allows you to get a guaranteed paralyze that you can stock up, so to speak, and use whenever you want which is what makes Killer Sweetheart so incredibly useful. Okay, so we are going to... We already changed over the boots. I'm going to take Shadow Heart over here. We are going to put... What's next? Where am I needed? Everybody else into hiding. These things have stayed interesting. Whatever comes, I'm ready. Actually, I'm going to move everybody else out here have to keep going just to be on the safe side this time and I'm just gonna be in here with shadow heart another bowl bearing the stains of an ancient blood offering another trial for lady Shah's initiates this one would put their skills of stealth and infiltration to the test. Those that can remain unseen and can okay, so the way this trial works is that you have two shadows that are wandering around. Okay. They have detection cones, which you can see, and if those detection cones hit you, they're going to find you, and the trial is going to end. Okay, So, there are a couple of different ways to do it, but at the end of the day, you have to get through a gate which you can't see in this view here and this gate either needs somebody who can lock pick really well or it needs a key that key is sitting right there now this lever moves these two walls to here and here they slide out and what that does is it changes the patrol pattern of this shadow. Okay. So, a couple of different ways to go about doing this. 
Um, the other thing to realize is that there are traps over here, and there are three of them. There's a plate here. There's a plate here. There's a plate here that you can't see. And there's a plate right there. Those are going to trigger flame traps to go off. Now, those traps don't do a whole lot of damage. And, again, it doesn't matter if you're sneaking through here or if you're walking through here. The detection cone, they don't find you except if the detection cones hit you. So, the sneak ability is just giving you the option to see the detection cones. Um, but once you know the patrol pattern, you don't really need it. Now, the thing that's important is to kind of watch this room here as the shadows do their patrols. Okay, and you can see that the detection cones do not enter into that room when the gates are closed. We'll wait for them to come back and you can see it again. Okay, you can see that their detection cones do not cause any detection inside this room, no matter where they are or which direction they're facing. However, there's a gap in this wall, and that gap allows you to misty step into that room and grab the key and then misty step back out of that room. Okay. Now, that takes two misty steps, and that's why having somebody like Will who can cast the misty step spell in addition to having the boots or a Gith Yankee to be able to do, to give the boots to and have their class action to do it makes this um, really easy to do. I have... more scrolls here. And I can give one to Shadowheart. So she's going to use her boots to misty step into that room. And then she's going to pick up the key. She's going to use the scroll to misty step out of the room and come back this way. And that just doesn't even take a whole lot of specific timing. Because the shadow is going to spend a whole lot of time over here. So we're going to wait for it to come over. And then as soon as it passes and goes back, we're going to walk in here and misty step in. Okay, so now that I'm in here, I can pick up the key. And now I can get ready to Misty Step back out. Okay, easy enough. So now all you have to do is make your way to that gate. And this is where when these things are left in place, the patrol cones here make it really easy for you to do that. So I'm going to wait for this shadow to turn around.
and over here is a button. Okay, and now it's just a matter of timing these two out. So, what you want is to be able to traverse up this section. Okay. I don't know what saw me there. I don't think I've done this perfectly on stream yet. I did it perfectly in my personal playthrough. Hurry. Time that one wrong. Open up the gate and you can grab the last umbral gem. That's the last one. The inner sanctum is within reach now. And there are a hundred ways to cheese that. There are a hundred ways to go about doing it a lot easier. An invisibility potion. Um during that run that you make there after you've opened up the wall makes that really easy to do as well. Um, one of the things that, again, and I explained this last time, that I'm trying to do is that I would never use an invisibility potion there for that. Um, and the reason for it is because I don't think about just this encounter. I think about the encounters that I'm going to have all the way through the game where that invisibility potion is going to be far, far more useful. Um, I... Play this as if I am playing honor mode, where every potion of speed and invisibility you pick up is going to allow you to make a boss fight ten times easier farther down the line. So I would never use a an invisibility potion there for that, especially with if you get caught, it doesn't matter. Um, it, you just have to make the run again. So that's how I think of... That's how I approach these things. Um, so I'm not saying that you can't do it. It's going to take me a little longer to do it. But that's just because I'm thinking of the future. Whereas you don't have to. And on balance mode, honestly, I don't have to either. Um, but that's how my brain works. So, now I've got four Umbral Gems. One of them... ...is going to be needed here. Wait. Nothing. Nothing's wrong at all. Hey, failed a perception check. It's fine. Really. I just feel we're on the right track. 
I'm right where I need to be. Under Lady Shah's gaze. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what's going to happen in this playthrough, Eric. Simply because on balance mode, very rarely do you ever need them. Um, but on honor mode, Might be a quick way to get potions, both stuff. that you find and you create, are almost the only way to make it through. Um, things things are just so much more difficult, and they go wrong so much more quickly. <laughs> So you tend to stock up those useful potions like that for things that you're going to need. I mean, for instance, not having invisibility potions on honor mode when you're going, when you're trying to approach the nether brain makes the ending about a thousand percent more difficult. But you need four invisibility potions to make your way through one for each one of your party members so yeah things it's stuff like that that i think of while i'm doing the playthrough okay so you drop all three umbral gems here and it opens this door what i mean by cheat by not needing the umbral gems this door here you can knock it. You can use the spell knock on this door and it will open. Um, you can't lock pick it, but you can knock it. I don't know if that was intended to be there or not, but if you cast knock on it, you can open the door and make your way in here without having to go through the trials. Okay, so I wanted to come in here just so I could open up the waypoint. Because you can see we're low on our action economy here. Okay. So. Okay. So opening up this waypoint just allows you to be to be back here to this exact same spot. Now entering into the Shadow Fell is a is the first point of no return. What I mean by that is that all these warnings that have been popped up by going to other areas um, are really false. They they don't tell you the true story. You can move back and forth to any of the waypoints that I've gotten so far. In the wilderness, the crash, the underdark, anything like that, I can move back and forth between them all the way up to this point. Once you go into the Shadowfell, everything in the wilderness is going to disappear, everything from the crash is going to disappear, and all you're going to be left with is the Shadow Cursed Lands. So if there are any items that you want to pick up either from the Emerald Grove or from the Zentrum hideout or from the Myconid colony, you need to go pick those things up now. You will still be able to go back to the Last Light Inn um, once you eggs or once you enter the Shadowfell. Because you're going to be back in the Shadow Curse lands after you're done. But anything else that you've done before. So if you need to go to Trail to Crags and pick up more items from Esther. If you need to go talk to um, either the Myconid or Blurg. Omelum or Blurg in the Myconid colony. If you need to go talk to... I can't remember his name. Inside the... Uh, Zentrum hideout, or you need to go talk to um, Aaron in the Emerald Grove to buy things, go do it now. And that's what we're going to, we're just going to take a quick round robin here. And go make sure that there's nothing else that we want to pick up before we go in here.
How much farther can I go? Okay, so we'll go over and talk to Aaron first. He's arguably the hardest one to get to. Just because of the run you have to make. And during this, we're going to be looking for, mm, I want to have a word. like I say, any potions, any items, anything like that that we want to stock up but on. Because this is going to be our last chance to do it in here. And I don't think with Aaron there's going to be anything much, but we do want to look through his potions and that sort of stuff. Ooh, Disintegrate spells really nice. Okay, so it doesn't look like... There's much in the way here, and... Yeah, all of these are just the regular armors that we had previously. So nothing new here. May you keep balance. So we will go to the interim hideout, see if they're still here. Yes. His name is right on the edge of my tongue, too. Brem. That's who it is. Something I can help you with? Of course. Got some interesting stock for a friend of the family. Okay, so again, the Titan string bow I want to pick up. Okay, ooh, some of these are good. He sells some really good dyes, by the way. All, of, all about the drip now. Okay, so nothing else here. No. Pleasure. Now, the Titan String Bow for me right now is not all that useful because none of my characters are actually Shadowheart is strength based now, isn't she? Yes, she is. That would get rid of the Darkfire Short Bow though, which allows her to grant haste. So yeah, I can probably swap that out. The Titan String Longbow is one of the best longbows in the game for your strength-based character, simply because it, it allows you to add your strength modifier to the damage. I don't have many shadow or strength-based characters on this playthrough. But that will be able to up her damage if she ever does need to use it. This is what you put on your Lazels um, and people like that, and your Carlax, people like that in the game. No time to rest. No worries, Eric. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. So now we're gonna go down to the Mike and a Colony. Yeah, Black and Furnace Red is really nice. 
swift as my feet can carry me. I want to go over here and talk to Blurg. Something's on my mind. Welcome back. Have you made any new discoveries? Let me see if it will. Whoops. Didn't need to do that. Welcome back. Have you? I do enjoy a good bargain. If anything, okay, in my so these is all a bunch of things liking. that we sold. Don't need the baneful. Don't need the cinder shoes. I mean, I might pick them up just because they're cheap, but I'm not going to use them. I don't have a heat build in here. I've experimented with, with heat builds a little bit. I can't find one that has enough gear that really makes it all that worthwhile, but I may experiment with it some more. Okay, and I think that's good. Very well. I have mushrooms to catalog. I greet you, sun child. Okay, creation's echo I don't need. Cap of wrath I don't need. And nothing else in here. The elixirs of psychic resistance I will buy. And I am going to pick up... Oh no, I've got two here. May your travels be okay. safe and swift. So now in here I'm going to put the cinder shoes away because I don't need it. One of these has all of these in it. I am ready. Have a lot on my mind. And, well, in it. Hey. A hero at heart. to live in more interesting times. Okay, and let's go ahead and change out all of this just because we can. Indigo on, I believe, right now. Sharp as ever. Let's get going. At least things have stayed interesting. I'll go do the rest of that off stream. You guys don't need to see me improve my character's looks. So now we'll go back to the, and we already got everything. Well, I'll go check again. I'm here. I believe we got everything that we wanted from Esther. But we will go check again and see. It's easy to get to her just down the stairs. Moving ahead. I need a quick word. Have you given any more thought to the retrieval of that Githyank here? I might have a few trinkets worth a glass. Okay, so... The graceful cloth I really should buy. The gloves of cinder and sizzle I'll buy as well. And I'll buy winter's clutches. So I will pick up a bunch of things here from her. One of these is going to be good for Gale's build.
Definitely the era of dragon slaying as well. Okay, so I think that's it. Happy are we? Very well then. And remember, their inventories change after long rests. And we'll hold off on using that for now, and it should have a backpack of arrows, yes. So let's take a look at this and see how many dragons slain it. We got three. Not nearly enough, or not nearly what I'd like, but again, thinking about stuff in the future, it's kind of like in, when you're in honor mode and you're playing, or just when you're playing a monk, you talk to Auntie Ethel in the grove, and you buy all of the potions of hill giant strength you can from her, and you buy as many as you can, and you rest, and you buy as many as you can, and you rest, to stock them up for the entire rest of your playthrough type of thing. So now we're going to head back to the Verge of Shadows and we'll head in. We're not going to take a long rest before we go in. Shah's grace, did we even make it this far? All right. No need to dash in ahead of me. I'm ready. Some prayers are answered more quickly than others. Let's continue. Good call. Thank you very much. And again, this is... Why well, I love my chat. You guys have always uh, been on top of this. And I have been using the Strange Conduit Ring previously. But I'm going to swap that to Killer's Sweetheart now. Your party is gathered. You are ready. Or so you hope. Now this is an actual warning. Um, this is the point where things are going to change and you're not going to be able to go back to certain locations. So this one makes it clear. The others, I wish they never would have put them in because it makes it's confusing. But this one, once you go in here, it's a point of no return. As you step into the silent water, a foreign dread travels through you. It curls its way up your leg, squeezing tight. Her domain. This is the Shadowfell. 
Okay, so this is our first time venturing into the Shadowfell. Okay, so this area works very similarly to... Um, actually, I take that back. It's second time venturing into the Shadowfell. It works the same way as when we entered into the Astral Prism. In that you can jump a long way. And not take any damage when you land. Hmm. Better take that. He's encumbered. What's taking up? Oh, got it. Why is she encumbered? Well, because she's carrying all of this stuff. And for that... Oof. I sold those backpacks not thinking. Will doesn't need his. I'm going to send that one to camp. And we're just going to do some searching on our way down. But none of this is stuff you have to pick up. It's just, again, stuff that I'm going to end up selling later on to be able to adjust vendor attitudes when I get into Act 3. I don't need the gold right now, but I am going to need that attitude adjustment later because stuff gets expensive and this is something that you can have to pay a lot more attention to in honor mode is vendor attitudes because things are so much more expensive that you basically loot everything that you possibly can in honor mode so that you can store it up and sell it later after you've donated gold to merchants to get their attitude up you can sell all this stuff to get all that money back Okay, now I'm going to put everybody into hiding here. Off I go. I'm going to break my group. I have felt you coming. The first in a century. 
You, who have come to seek the praise of your wicked goddess. You, who have come to drive a dagger through my heart. Not a dagger, a spear. My Lady Shah's spear. Her fate is mine to seal. Let me handle this. The fate you seal is your own. To be a Dark Justicia is to turn your heart from everything but loss. You will know no love, no joy, only servitude. Until, of course, your mistress inevitably discards you. And there is much she does not tell you. A terrible blood price that may extend beyond my own death. You feel Shadowheart bristling. This is important to her. That your bond is strong. You may yet be able to sway her from the path of duty to the path of light. And Nightsong is not blind to your conflict. Behind that raging heart is the restless beat of one who knows too well that her fate hangs in the balance. Well, well, well. What's that I sense? A spear intended for my heart? Empowered by your goddess, I. Empowered to kill the child of a god! Do you know what I am, little assassin? For I know you. A lost child. Frightened by wolves in the dark. What did you say? Much has been promised to you, hasn't it? But what has been taken from you? What do you know of your own heart? Your own life? I sense more in you than you know. Whatever you think you know of me won't matter once I become who I'm meant to be. So here's the same conversation that we've been presented with before. The important thing to know here is that you have to specifically tell Shadowheart to kill the Night Song if you want that to happen. So you do not have to persuade Shadowheart to do anything here. You can just say nothing. And Shadowheart's internal struggle will let her do the right thing. I... I can't believe I just did that. Lady Shah will disown me. What will happen to me? Not what will happen. What will you do? Your past is not yet lost. Your future is not yet fixed. Lay a hand on me in friendship, not quite Sharon. And I will fight the battle that has been waiting for me this last century. Then, oh then, we will have much to discuss.
have given me a great gift, little warrior. Don't you find it oh so curious that you would spurn your dark lady? Perhaps you feel a stirring of the truth already. But that will come later. There is a battle yet to be fought. You have done what we feared was impossible. You have released me from a century of sorrow. Your power is great. So too must be your weapon. You must choose what you will wield. And the Moon Maiden will provide. Thus I have said, thus will it be so. Are you ready? To kill Ketherick Thorn. We need to leave. Lady Shah won't stand for us to be here, not after what we did. What frightens me? She must be angry. Yet, I don't feel it. Or hear it. There's only silence. Let's get out of here, please. Whatever's coming, I don't want to be in the heart of the Shadowfell when it finds me. The Night Song will be headed for Moonrise Towers. We'd better get there. And see what she's unleashed against Ketherick Thorn. Okay, so you're going to receive the Moonlight Glaive, and we'll talk about that after the cutscene. Okay, so now the other thing you notice is that there's no fight down here. That's because we had the fight with Balthazar up inside the Gauntlet of Shark. In having the fight up there, you avoid the fight with him and his resurrected minions down here. So you have a difficult fight in one place or the other. The one thing that I did mention is that the fight down here, especially if you have darkness, is trivial. Because Balthazar loves to cast Ray of Sickness, and he can't do that into a darkness cloud. So he just walks around and does nothing down here. All of these spell casting skeletons and, and that sort of stuff up here can't do anything because they want to cast Ray of Frost or Ray of Sickness on you and they can't. So this fight down here is trivialized by using darkness. But if you don't have it, then fighting Balthazar up in the Gauntlet of Shar might be the better way to go. For me, it's six and one, half dozen the other because I'm able to trivialize both of those fights. So I am going to walk around and pick up everything that I can. The big difference between doing them the two ways is that down here, all these skeletons are going to have bones and maybe a dagger or two or something like that, and that's it. If you let Balthazar resurrect them, you're going to get a lot of armor pieces and that sort of stuff which can be very very useful to sell in 
Act 3, like I say, to influence vendor prices and that sort of stuff. So if you want to maximize your gold, and that's why in Honor Mode, I do this fight with Balthazar here and not upstairs, is just because at the end of this, I can pick up a ton of armor pieces, which I can then turn around and sell in going into Act 3. Okay, so we'll take the exit. And now we are back out here. And you can see Shadowheart was on the ground. You were missing for a moment. I... I thought I was done for. I thought perhaps I might have been dead. This... This is all like some sort of terrible dream. But it's real, isn't it? I stood before the night song. I heard Lady Shah's words. And I failed her. Worse than failed her, I defied her. Just because of what that Asimar said. I tried to leave, but Shah blocked me. Punished me for failing her. I thought I knew the limit of pain that the incurable wound could inflict, but... I had no idea. It felt like I was suffering the agony of a thousand people all at once. My blood was boiling, my hair was on fire. I thought I'd claw my own face off with the pain. But then she released me. Banished me, more like. She said I was an outcast. That all of her children would know me and revile me. Shadowheart looks distraught. Abandoned by her goddess and all former allies. And as for her divine magic... Admitting who empowers her now may break her spirit for good. You're lucky to have such confidence. Me. I think the full price of what I've done has yet to reveal itself. I'm a target to Lady Shah's followers now. Night Song promised she'd tell me something about myself. I need to speak with her as soon as I can. What she said to me back in the Shadowfell about the wolves. That's no coincidence. She took flight to hunt down Kethrick Thorm. All I can do is help hasten his demise. And hope that answers soon follow. Do you really need to ask? I'm sorry. I have a lot on my mind. The shadow fell. Night song. I can think of little else. That's not the first time you've made such a leap. I don't know. Maybe it's a Salunite trick, or another way for Lady Shah to test my faith. The sooner I speak to Night Song, the sooner I'll know what the future holds for me. Assuming I have a future at all. Okay, and now we picked up the Moonlight Glaive. So the Moonlight Glaive is a two-handed glaive. Comes with 1d4 additional radiant damage. It also... Just like the... A long way to go still. Never a dull moment. Uh, let's send it over to Shadowheart so that we'll be able to compare them side by side. Just like the blood of Lathander, it emits light in a radius. The difference is that this is not a blinding light like the blood of Lathander is. It's a plus two weapon... And it comes with Moonlight Butterflies. So once per short rest, as a weapon action, when you strike a foe, you conjure 
a swarm of butterflies, which grants advantage on attacks against the target. It's the fairy fire spell. So whenever you, once per short rest, you trigger this and you hit somebody with it, they're going to be under the effects of fairy fire. You also are going to deal additional psychic damage, um, additional to your proficiency bonus. So you're going to be stacking up some damage bonuses here. And at that point, you're starting to overcome some of the other possible stacking damage bonuses that occur with some other weapons. And that's why the Moonlight Glaive is going to turn into something a little bit later that we're going to keep our eye on. For now, I'm not going to use it. I want to keep Shadow Heart's armor class up with the Shield of Devotion and the Blood of Lathander, especially for the blinding effect. So I'm not going to use it now, but I am going to keep it around um, for later on. No, never mind. So now, if you go to your map, you can see all of your waypoints previous to Act 2 have completely disappeared. You are no longer able to go back. So... Our quest journal here is basically everything goes back to find Kethrick and deal with Kethrick, um, except for um, Astarian, of course, who we need to we need to talk to Raphael again at some point. But now everything goes back to Ketherick. And that's why you have a quest marker at Moonrise Towers. Now, we are going to take a long rest here. We'll go over to Moonrise Towers. But we are going to take a long rest. Do you know what happens when a devil is struck down on this charming plane of existence? It returns to the hells, to the very point where it last stood before venturing to whichever devil-forsaken plane it died on. In the case of our friend Yergir, the Orthon you so handily dispatched in the Temple of Shah, he manifested in my house of he returned to me chastened but intact. His wounds healed, his body restored. He thought I would dismember him. But he has his uses. So instead, I am re-educating him. We delivered the devil. Now I want what I'm owed. We had a deal. Indeed we did. I discovered all there is to know about those scars of yours. It's a rather grim tale. <laughs> Even for my tastes. As you wish. Brace yourself, Astarian. We're about to unveil your destiny. Carved into that ivory skin of yours is one part of an infernal contract between the archdevil Mephistopheles and your former master, Kazador Zar. In full, the contract states that Kazador will be granted knowledge of an infernal ritual so vile it has never been performed. The rite of profane ascension. It promises to be a marvelous ceremony, very elaborate, incredibly ancient, and entirely diabolical. If he completes the rite, he will become a new kind of being, the Vampire Ascendant. All the strengths of his vampiric form will be amplified, and alongside them he will enjoy the luxuries of the living. The arousals and appetites of man will return to him. And unlike Astarian, 
He will have no need of a parasite to protect him from the sun. But the ritual has its price. As all worthwhile things do, Lord Cazador will need to sacrifice a number of souls, including all of his vampiric spawn, if he is to ascend. Imagine how he felt then, when one of those precious spawns simply disappeared into thin air. The only missing ingredient is Astarion. You are the final piece he requires to complete the ritual. Your scars bind you to it. Your soul will set off a very wave of death, bringing Cazador his twisted life. And that, my tragic and toothsome friend, is that. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have business elsewhere. I was contemplating. It's a lot to take in. What do you think I should do? Hmm. The idea definitely has appeal. I could get rid of the worm in my head and still walk in the sun. I'd finally be free of the hunger. And if I'm the key to this deal of Cazador's, Perhaps I can turn this to my advantage. <sighs> I need to take the fight to him. And I need you to help me. Thank you. Okay, so we finished our deal with Raphael and by killing your gear we basically resurrected him again and he's now under Cazador's control so to speak again at the House of Hope and we can encounter him again later so there are other ways like I said to deal with your gear that make that a certain encounter with Raphael later a bit easier. Um, we're just not exploring them in this playthrough. I have a lot on my mind. Full-fledged vampires are not so easily slain. Astarian's master will be no exception. Fortunate for him, slaying monstrous fanatics is a pastime of ours. Okay, so we'll just quickly have our conversations. What can I do for you, my friend? I can't imagine how a Starian must be feeling. The terms of your own condemnation carved into your skin. A monster's actions. And monsters do not deserve such power as that ritual promised. When the time comes, Astarion will have his revenge, I'm sure. And it will be richly deserved. But not yet. So, what can I do for you? These lands will soon be free of Shah's grasp. You can almost sense it. If I was a bard, I might be tempted to draw comparisons between nature and myself, both shaking off Shah. But luckily for you, I'm no bard. <laughs> Wish I could say I was surprised about Cazador's pact. Where blood, death and betrayal parade, you can bet your ass a devil is riding Grand Marshal. We're going to keep Astarian safe. On my life, Cazador won't touch him.
I'm sorry. I might have come on a little strong with the dance invitation. I was imagining my younger days, prancing about without a care in the world. We may never be dance partners, but we have fellowship, and I wouldn't trade that for all the gold in the gate-counting house. Well, that's enough sentiment for one day. What did you need? The Blade of Frontiers at your calling. Okay, so we will head down here. Just check with Halson real quick. Oakfather, preserve you. Only by a reputation. She was present when we marched against Ketherick Thorm, but on the far end of the battle lines from where I fought. And in the chaos that ensued, well, our forces were scattered. I led some to safety, but never learned of her fate. I'm glad to hear she survived. <laughs> Though in truth, I should not be surprised. She was always said to be formidable and cunning, I could have learned much from her, no doubt. No matter how long I live, I will always strive to remain a keen pupil. Only a fool would think he could drink in all knowledge until none is left. There is always more. Nature's tapestry is infinitely complex. I cannot help but wonder how she would have handled some of the challenges I faced as Archdruid. Defended the Grove. Korga. The Shadow Druids. At least now we can benefit from her presence, and perhaps work to a common goal. Okay, and all that stuff that we've seen before, so now we'll just head back and take our actual rest. Here we go. Actually, before I do, I want to look at something... Okay, so the cold brim hat is here. The winter's clutches are here. The pride of the gate. The snowburst ring is here. Okay. Can't give up now. A hero at all. And The Ice Bite robe is here. Okay. Just making sure I can do something later when we get to a certain point. Hmm. Let's get going. Okay, we're gonna leave camp here. And we're gonna make sure we get all of our buffs back in place.
Let's move. Okay, and now we'll head toward Moonrise Towers. Here. Another step forward. And wait a minute, still make sure move. So that's progress. That this is still his packed weapon. It is. And now you see the bridge here is littered with the dead bodies of ghouls, harpers, and flaming fist. Hmm. Might find something useful. Okay, you can loot all of this. Okay, and we're going to keep going through the rest of the looting here until she becomes heavily encumbered. And Jahira's waiting for you. Unshackled from shadows. She will rise in moonlit glory and carve a path of brightness to the accursed one's second death. So saith the wise Alondo. That beacon of angelic wrath has taken the fight to Catherick on the rooftop. In the first line of defense are dead. But storming the tower won't be easy. And if we wait too long, Catherick will gather his strength and retaliate. For now, though, He's on the back foot for the first time since he returned from the grave. This is it. The spearhead moment. You brought us this far. So how shall we proceed? A sound strategy. Once it's done, me and my harpers will hold the ground floor while you hunt down the general himself. Floric left some of her flaming fist. They'll scout the prisons and the barracks below to ensure we're not taken by surprise. Say the word, and we're off. I'm touched, but I'm already spoken for. Very well. Side by side we'll stand, as we'll rip true souls from a false god. As good a prophecy as any. At the ready, Harpers! In this light, there will be victory. In this light, we will avenge the fallen! <sighs> the time has come. Gatherick will taste of death at last. And now you can see that Jahira becomes a follower. Yes. Okay, this makes it a lot easier to control what Jahira does during this fight. Now, you can't outfit her or anything like that. She is not a full member of your party. Her inventory is not accessible yet. She is a follower, but again... It's going to allow you to determine where she casts Ice Storm and where she casts Call Lightning and things like that, which can be a little frustrating. Um, if you are doing this fight on your own without having control of her, she can cast those things in... Um, inopportune times, I would say. So, Adept Marin here has a Mind Flare Parasite specimen, so if we pick that up, it goes to 9. And again, Shadow Heart is heavily encumbered now. We have another Mind Flare specimen here.
Okay, and now with Shadow Heart, I can send that backpack off to camp. And I can loot the last of these very heavy but yet very valuable armors. Okay. Quartermaster Tolly is out here with us. Okay, and you're going to find out how that plays out a little bit more. But you have an opportunity to sell items here. I would prefer... It's a grim tusk. Picking provisions from the dead. But the way I hear it, the fighting's not done yet. You need to resupply. I would prefer instead to... See... If I have any other... Oh, I don't have any bags or anything like that that she still has. The Shade Clinger armor... I'm going to pick this up just so I can experiment with it. Because there's a bug with it. Ooh, and red dye. Red dye's nice. I'm gonna go dye up all my characters off stream. Okay. So I'm going to. I think that ends what I wanted to do. Lady Light away. But she'll be available throughout this entire thing. Okay, so inside here you can see this is where Adept Zarel is. With haste. Jahira is definitely with us. You dare show yourself here after all you've done! You have betrayed me, you have betrayed General Thorm, you have betrayed our god! And for what? These harpers. Moonrise will be their tomb, and in death, you will all serve the Absolute. Where's the fun in that? Boys, make this traitor bleed. Okay, so initiative starts for the entire world here. Um, and, ooh, Zarel rolled badly on this. Um, and you see that we've also been joined by Barnabas, Tamili, and Timothy because we freed them from the their uh, mind shackles earlier. We have they have now become allies to us during this fight. Okay, so Shadowheart and my bard both being up front makes this incredibly nice. That was a mistake on my part, but it's not going to hurt me. I forgot about her counter spell. She loves to counter spell everything, um, and I should have cast a spell by Shadowheart first.
before I did that. So... So Will is able to cast Darkness instead. The only problem being is that I can't get him down into the darkness I wanted to place as well. Two steps at a time. So I'm going to have to adjust my darkness to be back here, which I wanted to get all of... I wanted to get Zarel in it as well. I need to do that yet. Let's save that. I don't really care about that. Should have stayed in the darkness. Okay, for Jahira. I can still move fast when I need to. Okay, so she can't see through that to cast it. That's going to be the same thing for Call Lightning, I bet. Yes. So I'll we'll have to get that out next turn. But for now, I'm going to Wild Shape her. Just so if she gets hit... She won't take any physical damage. Let's go. That's going to use my bonus action, though. Swift as my feet can carry me. <laughs> Should have stayed in the darkness. Ooh, 
that's a lot of damage. That was a reaction, folks. That's what Sentinel does. Again, y'all should have stayed in the darkness. This is gonna hurt. Let's start getting some attacks on her to remove those mirror images. Okay, because everyone that misses is going to remove a mirror image. Who's still up top? Him. Him. Okay, I don't need a paralyzing critical on that. But now I've gotten a kill, so Executioner is ready. So any attack that I want to be a crit, I can make it a crit, and then that will automatically proc Paralyzing Critical as well. And you see it's going to ask me if I want to trigger it. Was her concentration broken during that hit? Okay, yes. I lost, I failed. Oh, wait a minute. It says it succeeded on the Constitution saving throw. So, why is Call and Lightning still not available? Okay. Well, that's... Too bad. So, again, I'm going to start removing these mirror images. Okay, good. That's going to remove all the mirror images. Okay, I'm going to move Will a bit further in here. I don't need to quicken any of this. Who is... Oh, there he is. I'll finish him off. so I can't jump through there. Let's get me into the darkness first and then see if I can jump out of it. I can't.
bring me into battle. Still breathing, despite everything. Actually, no, do not end that. I could just barely get out. That would leave me open to attacks, though, here. I'm gonna hold this turn. Still on my feet. Because I'm threatened? Really? By the Guardian of Faith? Okay. Which one of you is concentrating on that? Or which one of you cast it? I think it was this one. And I can't cast out of this. Can't. So I'm going to wait one more turn with her. Now I am going to counterspell that. She was about to AOE it on everybody here. And I'm not having that happen. So she's Okay, so they're all marked as allies. No, I really want to I really don't want to use that yet. Celebrin is there. This other zealot's down here. No, we'll cast that at first. That should give all of them some minuses to hit. Yes. Got like one hit point left, two. I'll save some more of the Harpers.
Hey, he might be safe in the darkness for a little bit. Trigger death ward. Okay, so Shadow Earth's got a 70% chance, and this is going to inflict radiating orb around again as well. And Zarel is just about done. They had some reinforcements join the fight. And I believe that's from farther in here. Yes, it is. Which, again, doesn't matter to me in the slightest. Oh, interesting. I've never seen them take the high ground before, but I like it. Hey, and again, can't cast chain lightning for or call lightning from inside, so you just step out and do it there. Can I get him? I can. One spell I was hoping for them not to cast. Wait and see what she does on her next turn. Death Ward's now triggered. <coughs> oh, come on. One of you guys? Thank you. So this time I'm going to step out the front. Father, ease my way.
Hope you, now, you guys can get a taste ass. of your own medicine here. Can't slow down. Don't think I'll be able to reach him. Yeah. Doesn't bother me though. I like that. in that corpse. You should take a look. Okay. Where am I needed? Normally, if you're able to get darkness cast into the middle of the room here, things normally work out quite a bit better. Um, if you can get the two zealots in the back into that darkness, they want to stay in the darkness and attack to find a way forward. Your character's there. Um, which makes things substantially easier on the Harpers um, at that point. But there is no achievement for keeping all of the Harpers alive or anything like that. So it's not like there's, uh, you know, a benefit to keeping them all around. Um, basically, whatever happens to them, happens to them. And I'm gonna have everybody loot everything. The argument solver is not all that great. It does have a poison mist ability, which can be both good and bad. I normally just end up selling it. And I think there's one of these bodies that is actually glitched. So when you loot it, it thinks you're trying to steal... And all the rest of this that I can't loot, I'm going to send to camp. Because, again, I don't need to sell any of this here. So all the way down through here, except for that. Now, my camp chest is going to become a little bit cluttered here, and I'll have to sort that out afterward. 
but for now, I want to keep all of this stuff. Lantarv is going to have three items here from his inventory. The soul coins can go to camp. The sentinel shield gives you advantage on perception checks, which is kind of nice. The halberd of vigilance, along with that, helps kind of do a poor man's uh, sentinel feat, basically. Again, we're just going to go looting everything. Zarel is going to have a parasite. <laughs> the Absolute's Protector, which gives you the ability to... Cast Fire Shield Chill, um, which is going to last for 10 turns. It's got Shield Bash, which we've seen before. Also, if you wear it, if you have the Absolute's brand, all damage receives from spells is reduced by one. Now we're up to 11. So, can't take any more. Oh, the whole club thing. Jeez, they really need to fix that. Okay, and then down here, you're going to find a few things laying around, specifically a bunch of stuff that was marked as steel previously. You can now take. Might as well. There's a lot of camp supplies down here. There's a lot of silver stuff that you can loot. some more camp supplies. I'm going to leave those on her for now. And then sitting here, you can loot all of these potions that were on Aludra's desk. Crafting supplies. Some good crafting supplies. crafting supplies. Hmm, let's see. And 
These are just the Harpers that have moved in there. Okay. More crafting supplies. Whoops. Okay, so now we'll head back out here to the main room and cross to the other side. And you can pick up all of this stuff that was lying around over here. from Lantarf. And again, just take it all. Even if you're in my case, you just have to throw it into your camp chest. That's fine. We'll get it all out later and sell it. Nothing. As I've told you before, the one thing that's going to constantly annoy me about this game was the pathing. And now we can make our way around here. We are encumbered now, but again, I'm not too worried about that. Again, now you can loot all these chests, cabinets, paintings, all that sort of stuff. Okay, and now we will get rid of all of this. But from here. But not that, 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 that. All of that can go to camp, that can go to will. Okay, now again, the Harpers have taken control of the first floor, and they're going to secure the first floor and the prisons down below. So we don't have to do that. I'm going to drop a short rest. You can see on our mini-map that we have some people above us who are waiting for us. Okay, so once we get here, we're going to go into hiding again. Because the fighting is not done here inside Moonrise. And we're going to stop everybody here. 
going to break our group and take a look at what we've got. So here we've got three Necromites and we have Radesia back here waiting for us. Okay, and here we don't care so much about our darkness um, and what happens with it, but I'm going to cast it way out here as far as I can get it without moving. And without getting into their detection cones. I want to make sure I'm not casting it on top of that thing. Don't waste a step. Okay, and now I'm going to move up into this. What happened here? Okay, she was not inside of it. Let's not get caught off guard. I can't wait Can I do anything time. outside of the reaction here? Ooh, that might cause a a bug. if I do that while they're in the middle of a reaction. Can I move out here? I can't, okay. All right, well, I will counterspell that one. Okay, so now I'm in combat, which kind of halts things. going to protect her for a little bit. I don't want to attack Jahira. I want the Necromite. Hold a 33. Oof. Which way is she's facing the wrong way? That was a, that's a mistake. short rest after this, which is good. I'm going to show you how big a mistake it was to be facing the wrong way. Okay, so the Mercolite Scourge, this is a flail that does 1d6 necrotic damage. Now that's important because very few weapons do an additional 1d6 of any 
type of damage. Uh, most of the time, the additions are 1d4. The charge-bound Warhammer does 1d6 only if it is being used as a packed weapon or by an Eldritch Knight. The Light of Creation does 1d6 lightning. And it's one of the only other weapons so far that we've seen do 1d6. But the downside to it here is that it stuns the wielder unless it's a construct. That's why I have to use circuitry interface. However, the Mercolite Scourge does not have that. It is a straight 1d6 necrotic damage. So if I change this out, it's right, right now it does 1d8. If you're using it with a shield, that's the same as the Chargebound Warhammer. Instead of doing lightning damage, it's going to do necrotic damage. And I can still add the additional cold damage from Elemental Weapon to it. So this is one of the highest damage single-handed weapons that you're going to encounter this early on in the game. And it allows you to basically swap between necrotic damage and lightning damage based upon what you want to do. The other difference is that the Chargebound Warhammer is listed as plus two here with two separate um, plus one bonuses. That's because it's a plus one weapon and then favored weapon kicks in when you bind it. So you're going to get one additional two hit and damage with this over the Mercolite Scourge. But the Mercolite Scourge is a good weapon to have as a backup if you find something that's resistant or immune to lightning damage. You can prep for that encounter by changing over to the Mercolite Scourge instead. Okay. So now for the rest of this... Have seen everything. Okay, the Moonrise Guard key is going to open up all this, but we've been in all of these locations. So the only location that we Seems simple enough. haven't been, or that we haven't looted, is inside his bedroom, Catherick's bedroom. Better be cautious. Okay, so it looks like we did loot some of this. We just didn't weren't able to take the stuff that was marked as steel that was laying around. So, looks like we are good now. Want to go this way. We're going to head to the roof. Okay, now being here on the roof, heading through the ornate door is going to take you up to the roof. And this is where you want to have your executioner saved up um, and that sort of stuff let me guess you need something she still has plenty of spell slots left I'll leave her in wild shape for now though um, make sure that you have taken a short rest here at least to get back any divine smites or spell slots you're not going to honestly need a whole lot during this encounter um, I have found. Oh, and Glorik's unlooted here. Nothing there. 
But you are going to have a bunch of enemies, and you're going to be surrounded. And this is where darkness is, again, going to play a big part in how this plays out. What path lies before me? You. What have you done? What have you done to me? Okay, so... Here we have some options. The Paladin played this out one way. Um, I'm going to play it out a different way. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to start with this persuasion option here. Telling him that his wife would have wanted more from him than this. There is no redemption, can't you see? It is too late. If Melodia could see all I've done, she'd know. She'd know her husband died long ago with Isabel. Unlike Isabel, he could not be brought back. I wish it could be so. I do. But the Moon Maiden did not intervene when my life was dismantled piece by piece. And when I tried to buy it back, it cost me everything. Everything. We are copper pieces in their belts. Tokens to be traded for scraps. You have beaten me, true soul. But the gods beat me first. Aelin. Rise, you dog. Retribution has come, and her sword is my sword. Ketherick Thorne would sooner die than lay down his rank cause. Isn't that right, General? I was a fool to hesitate. Power like mine cannot be hidden, cannot be cowed. But power like mine has a price. A price I am destined to pay. You have one last chance to bow. Once it's gone, I'll have no choice but to destroy you both. Do you hear? Bow! The prison. You've had it all this time, you worm. You will bow before me. And if you will not bow, you will break. He will crumble at the power of your touch. Give him all you have. The gods fight at our side! Oh, boy. And I rolled first with everybody. Okay, so taking stock of the battlefield here, Sisdera is down here in the middle. She has grave magic, so whenever she deals magic with a spell, she's going to do an additional 1d8. She also has tenacity. She's carrying another Mercolite Scourge, so her base attacks are going to be doing another 1d6 necrotic damage. But again, one thing she's not immune to is darkness. All around the outside are necromites. 
The Necromites again have dark vision. That does not make them immune to the darkness spell. Catherick is up here on top. He has dark vision, but again, he's not immune to darkness. He is a paladin and he hits really hard and he is hard to hit with his 22 armor class. So trying to find a way to deal with him um, is going to be what we're going to focus on here in a little bit. We have a luxury here of being able to get our entire party here into a location. We are not going to be able to control Dame Aelin. She's going to be a problem. Um, 18 armor class. She has resistance to radiant and necrotic damage. She's also a paladin. She has extra attacks, so she can deal a lot of radiant damage as she goes, but she's pretty easy to hit, uh, respectively, for the people that are in here. So you don't have to keep her alive, quote unquote, but since she's going last in this order, we're going to do our best to protect her here. And I'm going to start that off by moving in front of her here. Can't slow down. And casting darkness right on top of myself. Nocturne. Okay, now Aelin is going to be blinded by that, but she's not going to stay in this. And I'm trying to get her to move out and move toward these Necromites and not towards Catherine. She will lose in a fight against Catherick. She just will. And I'm trying to avoid that or delay it as long as I can. Going to move Shadowheart in here. Got to move. And I want to see what the radius is here. Okay, so it's not big enough. I'd be getting one, two, three, four, five. I can probably adjust that a little bit. I'm just missing Kethrick there. But I am getting five more. Should have jumped. I would love to get Kethrick with this as well. So I'm going to hold off on this and just cast Spirit Guardians here. I'm also going to get my Spiritual Weapon out. And I can't see up there. Let's see where I roll an initiative, though. I can't, I can't see this location here. Okay, so I rolled not so great in initiative on that. Time to push my luck again. So now we're going to get everybody, and I'm going to jump in here. Because I want to get close enough to Shadowheart that Sentinel or that Sentinel will proc These boots have seen once Sestera goes. But I'm not going to deal damage to her. On the victor's path. I think 
we have given offense. Going to utilize the movement speed to get down here. I'm going to dismiss her wild shape. And then move her into the darkness as well. I wonder if this is worth the cost. I'm going to save my action surge. Until Catherick gets down here. Is all that matters. So I'm going to proc Sentinel here. I'm going to proc Wrath of the Storm as well. I'm not going to use Destructive Wrath yet. Can't even catch my breath. Listera's got 22 hit points left. And that's why you throw the spiritual weapon out there. Basically, it's just to distract him. They're going to cast Reach from Beyond. It's basically Chill Touch um, as a cantrip, and they're all going against the spiritual weapon. This is what they love to cast. You cannot cast this into a darkness spell, though. Because it's a ranged attack roll. Okay, now Aelin. I'm hoping she just goes over here and tries to hit them. Okay, that's perfectly fine. I am more than happy with that. So, Ketherick is over here now, so... Oh, boy. Let's, uh... Let's move up. We'll still be able to get those two. Maybe we can get these two. And this one. As well, here. Okay, so I can get those two. I got that one. I'm not going to be able to get both of these, but let's just move left a little bit. Now we can get that one. So we've got one, two, three, four, and Sisdera here. Actually, I moved a little bit too far because I'm pretty sure I can get that one too. Let's just move back a tad bit. Yes. So now I've got six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and now I'm going to move back into the center of the darkness, trigger my spirit guardians again, and I'm going to get spiritual weapon out again, and Ketherick is on his back. Which means that now we have advantage on attacks against him. I am feared, though, which sucks. <laughs> um... Sometimes the only way out is through.
was looking to see if we had a way to to get rid of fear and we do not because I'm immobile is Aelin frightened as well she is so that's a shame I'm not going to be able to take advantage of Ketherick being on the ground here because I'm immobile I am frightened I can get this if I can get this to a one on one fight with Ketherick, this thing is going to end pretty quickly. Another fight. Let's go. And again, I'm going to hold hold my action surge. But I will use my bonus action here. What must be done? And yeah, since she's frightened, she's not going to be able to do anything from here. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so now we need to try and save Dame Aelin from herself, basically. Okay, and the way we're going to do that is to recast Nothing important is ever Darkness. Easy. So, Ketherick's blinded, Aelin's blinded, but I don't care. Now, what I'm going to do is move myself, as many of my characters as I can, into a position to be able to get attacks off. Well, so much for peace. And I want to start that with Kurs. Can I get up here? I certainly can. Light on my feet. And now I have advantage against him. Because he's blinded. Now these are still not great chances to hit. So I'm gonna hold off on using his attacks here first. I'm going to jump Shadow Heart over here. I was hoping I would kill the Necromite. But I guess we'll do it that way. Got to press on. No holding back. No. Let's end this. Actually don't want to end her turn. I want to move her back a little bit. Okay, and now Will. Just want to get him into the darkness. Fleet of foot. For the most part. Okay, and again, like I say, it's not great chances to hit. Can't even catch my breath. Gonna hold on curves. Blood comes easy these days.
Best be on my way. Hey. Love comes easy these days. And Jahira. I don't think she's going to be able to cast. Call oh boy, she can. That's cheeky. Enough circling. Okay, I wanted to get her into the darkness. She's not going to be able to make it. So, Catherick is going to be able to jump out of there and attack Jahira on Never this turn. But, we now have a bunch of attacks to try and land here on Thorm. Now, you do not have to kill Thorm. Once his hit points drop to a certain point, there's a cutscene's going to trigger here. So, I am... Um, going to just see if I can drop damage on him here and see if I can get at least one out of these four to land. Well, that ends that. Enough. My lord beckons me. You must return to your prison and my daughter must be reclaimed. Your daughter? You will fall as sure as she. This has only begun. Okay, so, Aelin hesitated. She was distracted by the name Isabel, for some reason. And she ended up getting hit and taken by the tentacle. Okay, so here we can now do some quick looting. Another Mercolite Scourge here, and a Bone Key. Moving in. I don't need two of these. Here on the table is a note from Gortash, which basically th lets you know that Gortash is in on this whole thing as well. This is a note to Catherick from Gortash, letting them know that the prism is out there and that the Gith Yankee are after it. We already knew that. Here on the table is going to be a few more camp supplies. I don't think these do anything. Okay. No one stirs. Want to back off there a little bit? All Thank right. you. What now? And we have some books here that are always going to have some amazing spells on them. At the ready. What's hiding here? Ok, 
Okay, so yeah, these aren't anything. Just decoration. And we do need to take all of these alchemy supplies and put those away. Put the keys away. So all of this, just go over here. And then up here at the top, you have the scroll of her glory. Did you read it? Basically talks about the absolute um, and that sort of stuff. Something else you can pick up and sell later. And then you have a heavy chest at the back. That's the bone key opens that up that we looted just a second ago, and this says the Ring of Exalted Marrow on it. Now this allows you to cast Exhort the Risen, which is a an Oath of Vengeance Paladin, um, or no, is an, an Oathbreaker Paladin spell. You can subjugate the undead with your commands. It also allows you to cast Ghoulish Touch. Now Ghoulish Touch is a ring that allows you to do a melee attack roll to paralyze a target. It's not a guarantee that you're going to do it, but in my experience, it's a pretty good chance that you're going to be able to do it. So again, if you're trying to paralyze your target, which remember, paralyzing means that all attacks against the entity that are melee based are always going to be crits. Which when you have a paladin with you can mean a boatload of damage. That ring can be very, very useful. Okay. So it's one of those things that I tend to put on um, after I've used up Killer Sweetheart and Surgeon Subjugate. After I've used the Surgeon Subjugation app, Amulet and Killer Sweetheart, I'll swap that out to put the Ring of Exalted Marrow on to be able to get me that crit that has nothing to do with these two paired together. And then I can change that amulet out for something as well that may give me Arcane Synergy um, as well. So there are options that you can play around with these with these things and kind of pair them all up. Okay. But yes, a very good ring to have. Now Jahira is down here. And we will end our live stream by talking to her. Very well. The general will call that a tactical retreat, I'm sure. But you have him on the run. That thing he summoned was illicit. Follow it below and find him, before he has a chance to subdue the Night Song again. Better they stay here, and hold the tower should Ketherick's army catch wind of our assault. But if you have room for one lone soldier, I would face Ketherick by your side. Okay, if you click join me then... You have numbers enough already, I think. You'll want a small force if you are to finish this quickly. Now you're going to get the option to recruit her as a full member of your party. Okay, so at this point now she is recruitable and able to join you. However, I don't have any need for a druid for the fights that I'm going to encounter here. Um, I am going to level her up at some point, but I am not going to take her along on this fight. Don't rush on my account. She will stay up here. You will get some more dialogue options. 
um, with her in your party facing Kethrick, but it's not something that I'm going to do. What we're going to do is end the live stream here. And when we come back, we are going to take a long rest and head down into the Alithid colony. I am going to spend a few minutes and just change out some of my coloring and that sort of stuff through this. But at the start of next live stream, we are also going to make a change to our party makeup before we go into the Alithid colony. We're going to swap Will out and replace him with Gale. So in the interim, also off stream, I'm going to respec Gale and get him set up in the same way that I have him in the Paladin live stream because we are definitely going to want to have him along with us for a cutscene interaction that happens while we're down there. So I think that's uh, a good point to end it today. Um, again, thank you all for being here today. I certainly appreciate it. Without your support, none of this would be possible. This is Commander Jerval saying until next time, fare thee well.